so we were supposed to have somebody else here to help me today with the camera. Uh, if Are we starting? Yes. All right. So from the last Greek class I did to this one, we try to listen to what you all said. We try to make some changes. Uh, the problem was the camera angle. When I'm doing something down here, I will move the computer this way. If you can see, great. If you can't, tell me to alter the thing. We also got a new microphone and I hope you can hear me. And a lot of the complaints were you can't see what I'm doing back here. So we got a camp stove. We'll put it here and we'll show you how to do it this way. Hopefully you will get a better uh, class than last time. So I'm Mike. Um, I'm a chef here in town. I used to be a private chef at Reynolds Metals, Crestar Bank, which is now Truist. Uh, worked around town, Country Club of Virginia. I have my own company, Gunther's Gourmet. That's my stuff I make over there. That's a whole nother project, but I am Greek. I also am a, uh, I'm second generation Greek and I'm a U of R grad as well. So we've got a lot of um, overlap here. Uh, Peggy and I have known each other for what, 30 years now, I think, just in the food service industry. Today, we're gonna do Greek food again. Uh, the pastichal, it takes a long time to make. It's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of things. The hardest thing you're going to have to do is temper your eggs and make your bechamel. And your bechamel is a mother sauce. So let's get cracking on this. Once this is all going in, in the oven, we're going to do a mezzi platter. It's almost like an Italian antipasta platter, uh, but we'll make a dip. We'll make a scordalia, which is a, a, a Greek potato dish. We'll make the uh, um, the tzatziki, uh, we'll do um, uh, the, the spicy feta dish, and then we'll platter up some stuff. We got some wine. Um, stop me when you have questions, uh, or we're just going to get cracking on this because the pasticcio does take a long time. I have pre-prepped some stuff. The pasta. I've already cooked the pasta. I don't think y'all need to waste 15 minutes of your time uh, watching pasta boil. What I used is this pasta. And I'm gonna tell you where I get all my ethnic food or my Greek food is at Nick's Produce on Westmoreland. I don't make any money by saying that. I just like the place, that's where I get it. This pasta is long noodles. This is what you make pasticcio with. They end up looking like this, all right? I didn't think y'all needed to boil water and watch the pasta being made. Uh, once that's done, I put it in a bowl, toss it really lightly in olive oil so it doesn't stick. We're all set on that. Pasta is made. You can do this the day before. We're going to start the meat sauce now. Um, I have four ounces of butter in the stove back here. I also have four ounces of butter in this pot for the bechamel, and I have the milk already hot. Again, we're just trying to get things going. You don't need to watch me heat milk up. So one thing about cooking is your mise en place get everything together. We have our ground beef. We have our eight ounces of um, tomato sauce. We have our onion, cinnamon, salt, parsley, pepper. We've got um, breadcrumbs and we've got the cheese. Uh, a traditional uh, Greek dish, we'll use a mixture of uh, Parmesan and Romano. This is just straight up Parmesan. You know, it's, it's all depends on what part of Greece where you're from and what your grandmother had you do. So um, what we're going to do now is dice an onion. We're going to cook this out and then set it aside. But um, I didn't dice the onion because I wanted to show you all how to dice an onion easily. Of course, I've cut it off. I have peeled it. I've left the root, but I've cut off all the little hairs. And then you're going to get your chef knife. Um, I use an eight ounce chef knife. I like them with the rivets in it because they hold up better. Knives without the rivets tend to come apart. This will eventually come off. But anyway, so in order to, to um, dice an onion, an onion is centrifugal, you're just gonna wanna come down crosswise. So you split the onion that way. You're going to want to make two cuts into it, depending on how big the dice is, and then you cut across. Now, when you hold your knife, you grab it up here, grab it here. Don't hold it back here. Don't do this. Don't do that. Get a good hold of your knife. If you cook every day, you'll get a callus right there. 
But as we go down, your onion is diced. You really don't have to do much more to it. It's all the same size, it's all diced, and it's all ready to go. We save the scraps for stock. So we'll do it again. The other thing about it is if you can see my finger, I curl my knuckle under and I rub the knife up and down my finger. And as I move, I do this. If you keep your finger like that, you'll chop the tip off. If you do that, nothing's gonna happen. So let's do it again. And there's your whole diced onion. Quick, simple, efficient. And they're all about the same size, so they'll cook together. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat these up in the butter. I've just melted butter in the pan. I don't know if you can see that. And we're gonna, we're gonna sweat the onions out in the butter. We're not gonna caramelize them. We're not gonna brown them. We're not gonna get a lot of color on them. We're just sweating them out, getting the flavor, softening them up a bit, and then we'll add the meat and we'll cook that out. And while that meat is cooking, we'll get to the bechamel sauce. That's the three parts of the pasticcio, the meat, the bechamel, and the noodles. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start this. And the good thing about getting your mise en place together is it's all here. You don't have to scramble. You don't have to go look for cinnamon or parsley or open the can, get your mise en place together, have everything laid out, have everything together and have everything um, at your disposal so you can just make your food. The other thing real quick is when you use a cutting board, put a wet towel down, it keeps it from sliding on your counter. So what we're gonna do now, I hope you can see this, is we're gonna start the bechamel. And again, there's a lot of moving parts. And if you have questions, just ask. I have four ounces of butter and I'm going to make a roux. A roux is flour and fat, and it's a thickening agent. What you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to thicken the milk back here, which is warm. Uh, you can see that. Um, you wanna thicken your milk and that's one way to thicken it. You can do it with cornstarch. You can do it with um, other things. A roux is a traditional way to do it. So we're using a 50-50 mixture of flour and fat. If you look on the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, I think that works out a little bit better than the last time I did the class when I just uh, um, I, uh, wrote you notes. I didn't take pictures. I hope you like that PowerPoint. If you do or if you don't, let me know what I can do to change it. But we're gonna make a roux. We have the, fl we have the, uh, we have the butter heated and then we're just going to um, stir it in, all right? And that's a little bit hot. I'm gonna turn it down a little. Now a roux, like if you're doing um, Cajun food, they will cook this all day long. They will cook it really slow. They will cook it until it is a golden brown. I mean, it is a thing. We just want to get a little bit of color on it. We just want to get it off this heat. It's actually cooking too quick. I'm not used to this stove. Um, and what you want to do is cook the taste of the flour out. I think if you make like corned beef on toast as a kid, you use this in the morning. If you make sausage and gravy, you, you will add the flour to your, uh, to your gravy and then, the, and then milk to that. And that's how you thicken it. But this is your roux right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the milk, put it in here and we'll bring it back up to temperature. Is everybody following me or am I going too fast? All good, Mike. All right. So we have our warm milk and we have our roux and you will see how quick this thickens up. I'm gonna start out with a spoon a wooden spoon. And as you can see, 
it's still thick. Once it starts to thin out a little bit, we'll get a we'll get a um, a whisk onto this to get any any lumps out. But as you can see, this is almost like your sausage gravy consistency. And this is how you thicken using a roux. Get a good whisk on there, get the lumps out. You want this to be smooth and creamy. I was wondering if you could use, uh, if you have to use whole milk only. It, it tastes better. <laughs> well, we I all mean, know that. Flat is fa fat is flavorful. I do use 2% milk. I don't use heavy cream. I don't use half and half. I don't use skim. I mean, you can... <sighs> You're not eating a healthy dish. It's got cheese on there. It's got meats on there. It's got pasta in there. This is not a, um, you know, I had a chef that always said, eat well, stay fit. You're still going to die. Why don't you enjoy a meal once in a while? Uh, but yeah, you can use 2% if you want. We're, we always use whole. One of the reasons is both my grandmothers born and raised in Greece, they would, they would not be appreciative of me screwing with their formulas and their recipes. So as you see, this is quite nice, quite thick. It's a whole different. We're gonna put it on the stove real quick and we're gonna bring it to temperature. And while that's happening, and I put the, I put the towel down here so I don't burn my board. The onions are sweated. They're translucent. They're um, they're not caramelized. You caramelize your onions, you're going to start adding a different layer of flavor that's not necessary in this dish. You will find Greek food is takes thirty seconds to make or three hours. There's no in between. So what we're doing is we're just going to break this up. And we're going to heat this meat up. I'm going to get this back on the heat. Mix it up well, and it should start going. Now the hardest part about this dish is tempering your eggs. Tempering means is we're gonna add the eggs back to the bechamel in a fashion where it becomes another thickening agent for the bechamel. Um, what you don't wanna do is just dump the bechamel on there because then you scramble your eggs. You pop them, all you gotta do, all you have is scrambled eggs. So you wanna slowly raise the temperature of the eggs up to meet the temperature of the bechamel and um, then once the eggs are in, they will thicken it uh, once you bring it back up to temperature. So we have six eggs. Mike, somebody has a question. Go ahead. Are you using beef or ground lamb? Beef, I am using beef in this. You can use lamb. Um, honestly, it gets more expensive. It's harder to find. Almost all your Greek restaurants are gonna use ground beef, I think. Um, go to Greece, they might use lamb or a combination, but we did use beef. Is that good? Yes, thank you. All right. So we're just going to whip the eggs. By the way, when you make scrambled eggs, whip your eggs like that too. Don't just put them in a pan and scramble them. You're going to get a much fluffier egg. Um, you've incorporated the yolk with the egg white thick and the egg white thin, and it just makes a better scrambled egg. So now we're going to temper this, and that's going to be 
basically part two or three, the pasta is one, this is two, the meat is three. There is a comment that they're glad they're not the only person that dribbles down the pan. Yeah, 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 it, 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 gets, it gets a little bit messy down here. Um, I do tend to stop and clean a lot. So if I start cleaning and forget about what I'm doing, I'm a little bit OCD with the uh, cleanliness. But the beef is coming along, it's starting to brown. So now we're gonna temper this. This is hot. This is cold. You want to get them to the same temperature without scrambling your eggs. So what we're going to do, can you all see this? It's going to be a little hard, but anyway. Yes. We're going to slowly drizzle this in. Take your time. You can see how slow I'm drizzling it. You don't want to get it too hot, too fast, or you scramble your eggs. So as you see, this is starting to increase in volume. And it's becoming room temperature. Normally I would just stick my finger in there if I was just eating it myself, but I don't I want y'all to think that I uh or if I'm in a professional restaurant, but I would just stick my finger in there to detect the temperature. But we're bringing it up to temperature. And just patience. As it comes up, you can start adding it a little bit quicker. And you can see how thick this is getting. It coats the back of the ladle. That's called nappe when it coats the back of your ladle. You'll also realize I got a ridiculous amount of ladles and whisk in this house. Um, one thing on your uh, syllabus or your PowerPoint presentation, when you are looking at your mise en place for your bechamel or cream sauce, however I labeled it there, why don't you add a quarter to a half teaspoon of nutmeg. I forgot to put that on there. We have nutmeg. I don't think it's on the recipe. I think I just omitted it by accident, but add yourself a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg. So that's looking, yeah, that is hot. That is the same temperature as this. We can add it back in now. And we just want the meat, it's, it's almost cooked through. All we're gonna do is remove some of the fat and then we'll add the rest of the ingredients and let it simmer. So this is looking pretty good. We can add it back to the bowl. We'll add half and then we'll add our spices. We'll add the nutmeg, salt, pepper, 
and you see you had it all weighed out. You didn't have to stop what you were doing. You didn't have to go look for stuff. It was all right there for you. And that's what the point of the mise en place is. It makes making these dishes so much easier. And we're gonna take this back to a low heat. Oh, it did drip. Um, <laughs> and let it and let it thicken. I have it on about four or five here. I, I hate these flat top ovens. It's what I got when I bought the house. I just had to replace it, um, but they do an okay job. But I have it on about four or five. I have the beef basically done. And what we're gonna do, and it's probably gonna be over here. I don't know if you're gonna see it, but we're just gonna go ahead and and uh, remove that fat. Uh, the easiest way to take all your fat out is to get a stainless steel bowl, put a, put a uh, strainer on it and just dump it in. All the meat will, um, all the fat will flow through when you put the meat back. That takes a little bit. That's another bowl, it's another thing to clean. I'm just give me five seconds and I'm going to just remove it with a spoon or with a ladle like you're supposed to. There's a question, how much of what spice did you add? Was that the um, nutmeg that you were talking about that you just added? Correct, I was a quarter, I think I calls for a quarter teaspoon. I probably added a quarter teaspoon and then a half of that again. I like, um, I like to have that flavor in my uh, pasticcio. You'll note a lot of the Greek dishes, they have cinnamon, they have nutmeg, they have those that, that flavor profile in there. Um, but yeah, add a quarter teaspoon of uh, nutmeg and that should do it. So there's your ground beef. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add our pepper, our salt, cinnamon, parsley. And then this is just an eight ounce can of tomato sauce. It calls for four ounces of water. Instead of measuring the water, I'm gonna fill this halfway up, get the rest of the tomato sauce out. And do you prefer stainless or glass bowls? For what? I guess for stirring, like when you did the eggs and so forth. Oh, I'm, almost every bowl I have is stainless. Um, and I think that just comes back from being in a professional kitchen that uh, if you break glass in a kitchen, you have to throw everything away. You know, you don't know where that glass went. I would have to throw all my prep out. I would have to throw everything out. We don't keep glass in kitchens. We don't let the cooks drink out of glasses. We don't let glasses in the kitchen. So everything I have is, is uh, stainless steel. So we're just going to give this a shot. You can smell the cinnamon. You can smell everything. What we're going to do is put this back on the stove, turn the heat down to two or three, and let the liquid cook out. So you've prepped out your pastizio, and that took about half an hour, but you got to consider that I started with the milk. I had that heated up. I, you know, I had a lot of the prep pre-done and stuff. This, this dish will take you two hours to make. Um, so you have your three parts. You have your pasta, you have your bechamel made, which is the hardest part of this, and then the meat is easy. So what happens next is once these are thickened, once these are seasoned, um, we'll, we'll assemble it. One thing I did do, is we're just gonna use a roasting pan to make it. Before you guys got on, I just took a, a, a pastry brush. I dipped it in a little bit of the butter. I buttered the bottom of this with some of the butter that we cooked the, best, uh, the roux in. And then I threw a little bit of the breadcrumbs down there just to give it a start. But there's no need getting more butter out when you had a cup of butter sitting here. So um, we're all square. 
depending on time, we can wait for this to come off, but we're gonna have to wait for it to cool. So what I did, is I've already pre-made it all and cooled it like we're supposed to. Um, so we can go ahead and assemble because this is going to take an hour to cook. Is that okay, uh, Peggy, if you want to do it that way? Uh, because we're going to have to wait about half an hour for this to finish cooking and cooling before we can assemble. Do you want to just assemble with the pre-made stuff or do you want to wait to see what we have? Um, whatever you think is best, Mike, we can go either way. What about the class? I think I just we're okay don't... with the pre-assembled because that lets you continue with what you're doing. Okay, that's what I thought. So I went ahead and, and uh, pre-assembled everything. Um, so let's get back to what we're doing. So we have the pan, a little bit of butter, a little bit of breadcrumbs down there. We have the bechamel pre-made and we have the meat pre-made and cooled. Um, We have Parmesan and we have some breadcrumbs. Uh, half the Parmesan and half the breadcrumbs will go into the beet when you're done. That helps absorb everything else. Uh, another part of the Parmesan will go into the uh, bechamel. And I'll show you that in the future. Um, uh, we will finish these off, but let's just go ahead and start this so we can get in the oven. Um, and quite frankly, if we have time, we'll make a whole nother pastizio. It'd be no problem because I got plenty of stuff to do too. Um, so assembling is quite easy at this point. Again, in my head, I made sense. Is everybody up to date with me? This is a little bit of a multiple part coming together. Does anybody have any questions? Does it make sense so far? If you have All a right. question, just unmute and ask. You're doing great. All right. I will tell you one thing about this pasta. It's long and it's tubular. Um, I don't have a pot tall enough to stick it in this way. So about this much of it sticks out. When you start cooking it like that, water will shoot out of the top of this and you have about 200 of these things in there and it just starts shooting water out the top like crazy so what i did is i took a roasting pan put it across two of my burners and then put the pasta in this way to cook it you can use ziti you can use penne you can use any kind of tubular pasta we just use this because it's traditional and you know we are teaching a greek class and we do want you to get the full effect of how we do things so we're going to put a good amount of the pasta at the bottom. We will sprinkle it with Parmesan cheese. And just a little bit of the breadcrumbs. I'm not a big fan of a ton of breadcrumbs, but we put a little bit on there. Now we're gonna mix our meat. Karen Meadows asks, what time do we come for dinner? You can come anytime you want. Walk my dog when you come in, it'd be in the fridge, make yourself at home. Um, the house has been vacuumed this morning at five o'clock, but yeah, anytime <laughs> y'all want to come. This is a big, dense and heavy meal. I live about four miles from the University of Richmond. Seriously, I'm going to give my neighbors some of this. I might try to go back to U of R and give you all at Osher some of this. For anybody who lives close to me, just let me know. I'll, I'll put a piece out for you. You can come pick it up. I, I, honestly, it's going to be way too much. So 
you've got your you've got your meat now. Kathy says this makes her smile. Do what? She says this makes her smile. Oh, it makes me hungry. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so this is the pre-made bechamel. Do you see how thick it is once it cools? Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that. So you let everything cool before you put it together. Yeah, you don't have to cool it as much. I may I prepped this stuff out yesterday just in case, you know, for, for the time factor. Um, I probably let it cool too much because I put it in the cooler last night. But um, yeah, you should let it cool a little bit. All right, and I'm glad we did because while I was doing that, we actually scrambled the eggs on that. So um, we won't be putting that together. So we're gonna add a little bit of more harm. And this might be a good example of why you pay attention to your bechamel. I'll show you because we just messed that bechamel up by uh, overcooking it. All right. We'll add a little bit more pasta on top. And we're not gonna use it all because it's getting over overfilled. And we will follow that again. This is something else we're going to do. That is not a very steady pan. Want to get the noodles tucked in? Okay. When you are basically done with your pastizio, get these noodles tucked in. We'll hit it with some more parm. Little breadcrumbs for color. And by the way, now that I'm thinking about it, whoever asked the question about the 2%, if you use 2% milk, you might need to add an extra egg yolk to that or an extra egg to, uh, to get the bechamel thickened. Part of the thickening comes from the fat. Um, you know, you add 2%, it's gonna be a little bit more watery. So what do y'all think? There is your pastizio. Uh, that went a lot quicker and a lot smoother and a lot faster than I anticipated because we did prep out. And that just goes to show you how well uh, having your mise en place together works. Um, but you have pasticcio. We're going to toss it in a preheated 350 degree oven and we'll see what happens with this while we do the other stuff. Okay. Any questions? How does that look? Delicious. All right. You're all right. Definitely. All right.
All right. So that that was the hard part. Uh, I'm gonna wipe down a little. Does anybody have any question about the pasticcio, the the uh, the meat, the bechamel? I'm gonna show you our screw up right now. Um, I really did screw this up, and that's okay. I mean, I screwed up a thousand things in my life um, because I was I was talking to you and not paying attention to it. This is what it looks like when you uh, scramble your eggs inside of it. Okay, there is another question. John Roberts says, you mentioned cooling the bechamel sauce. Is room temperature cool enough before you add the Parmesan? Uh, yeah, yeah, room temperature is fine. So this is a little thick. And as you can see, we scrambled the eggs in here. Um, when this happens, start over. Um, I mean, there's big chunks of scrambled eggs in here. And that was because I was facing you guys. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. And that's why I pre-made stuff too, because when I'm teaching, sometimes I get distracted. Um, lesson learned, pay attention, don't overheat it. But this would be the point right now where you would add the Parmesan to this. It's a little hot right now. I'm not gonna add the Parmesan because I'm throwing this away and I don't wanna waste Parmesan. So that was, uh, you know, it happens. So Mike, a quick question. When you're making that kind of sauce, it, it seems like you need to stir constantly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do not leave it. Just do not leave it. Um, here's the meat. I'm going to go ahead and finish this off because I will save this and make another bechamel later tonight and make another pasticcio. But we're going to add a little bit of breadcrumbs. And we're going to add a little bit of Parmesan. That'll absorb any kind of fat that's left in there or any kind of liquid. And then there's going to be your meat. You obviously saw the noodles. You obviously saw the uh, bechamel earlier. But um, that's your pasticcio. And now you see how easily you can screw up, because I did it, um, how easily you can screw up uh, a bechamel. You need to you need to tend to it constantly. I didn't want y'all staring at my backside the whole time. And uh, and uh, I wanted to get through this because we do have limited amount of time. We're 40 minutes into it. It's in the oven. And um, and um, you know, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to cook. So I wanted to get that going. All right, let's start on the is everybody good? There is a question. Go Karen. Ahead. Karen Meadows asked, did the egg scramble because you didn't stir enough? I didn't stir enough and it was too hot. And it, it just, what it starts doing, it starts cooking at the bottom. I wasn't stirring it. So it started scrambling the eggs at the bottom. And then I had it at a little too high of a temperature and it just, everything just popped. And, you know, we learn our lesson. Um, but yeah, stir constantly. The other way you can do it is in a double boiler. Get your, get your pan, fill it with water and, and then put your bechamel in a bowl on top of it and then turn it on and you'll be having the steam heat the bottom of the bowl and it won't be touching the uh, element directly. And it, it's less of a chance of, uh, it's less of a chance of cooking it. Does that make sense? Yes. Some of us are old enough. We actually have real double boilers. Right, right. You would, you would, Put your bechamel in here. This will be full of water. And then you would stir it this way because the steam would be heating the bottom of the bowl up. That's a better way to do it if you don't want to sit there and stir it constantly. All right, so let's get to our three dips. And then we will assemble uh, a mezzi platter, which is like an uh, antipasta platter. Um, the reason I chose these three dips is a, I only have so many Cuisinarts in the house and y'all don't need to be sitting here watching me cleaning in between each one. So I have a few different Cuisinarts up front here. Uh, the other reason is so we can use other equipment that you might not be familiar with, like a ricer. This is a potato ricer, best way to make mashed potatoes. Um, 
Again, I pre-prepped a few things out for the spordalia, which is the, um, the potato dish. Um, I went ahead, I cooked potatoes, diced them, cooked them, and they're soft. I'm just gonna heat them up a little bit to dry them out in the oven. Uh, somebody, don't let me forget that like I forgot the other thing. I don't wanna burn two things in front of you all today, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's go ahead and make the, um, Make the spicy, uh, make the spicy uh, feta dish. I'm just looking for my mise en place. So again, the three dishes are already divvied out. We have the squidalia, we have the tzatziki, we have the spicy feta. You have your banana peppers, I kind of drained them. You have your feta. You have your garlic, red pepper flakes, and then the liquid from the banana peppers to um, adjust the consistency. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna puree up these banana peppers and all the ingredients. It seems like a lot and it is a lot. It is a spicy little dish. Um, I'm gonna reserve some of that. Well, I'll put that liquid in there. That one doesn't look good. We take it out. You put weird looking stuff in there, weird looking stuff will come out. Red pepper flakes, garlic. Again, now, now you're getting into the easy stuff. It doesn't take much to uh, make these dishes. They're quick, they're easy, and they're tasty. I like to pulse the things. Give it a little bit of a stir. Get some of the, those red pepper flakes off the side. That should be good enough. Feta. Again, I'm not, I bought these at Nick's Produce. This is not domestic feta. This is uh, from Greece. It's made from sheep's milk. It's gonna have a completely different flavor of the feta that you get in the grocery store made from cow's milk. Um, this is excellent. You can get the feta made from cow's milk. You can do it. You will find it's crumblier, but it comes in about eight slices like this. There's a whole different texture. It's creamier. It's a whole different flavor than the domestic feta you get in the store. And leave it in the brine. But that's the brand I get. So what we're going to do is we're just going to crumble this up. If you got a glove on, that's the best spatula around. You can also get in there, make it a little creamier. We'll add a little bit of the liquid. You want it so that you can dip in there without breaking it. You don't want it so thick that every time you put something in there, it breaks. There's a question, where do you purchase the feta? I get mine at Nick's Produce on Westmoreland in Richmond, Virginia. I find that whenever you're gonna make an ethnic dish, whether it's Asian, whether it's South American, whether it's Latin or it's Eastern uh, or Mediterranean, go to your Mediterranean stores. 
you get so much more for so less. You will buy a little bunch of parsley or chives. By the way, I could not find good chives for this recipe, so I just left them out, okay? They would add a little bit of flavor, but I went to like six different stores and did not find chives, so we just don't have chives in this recipe. I know it calls for it, a little bit on top, but you go to an ethnic store, you go to Nick's Produce, you go to Tan A Market on the corner of Horse Pen and Broad for your Asian food. There's African stores, there's Asian stores, there's Indian stores. Go there to get your product. A, they run through it a lot quicker than a regular grocery store. And B, so it's fresher and you got a longer shelf life. And B, it's usually better quality and it's cheaper. That's just my opinion. And again, I, I do know the owner of Nick's Produce. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't get paid for pushing his product or his store. So again, you can taste the banana peppers, the feta shines through and it is spicy. So that's the first of the dips. We're gonna set it aside. Any questions? Don't forget your potatoes. Thank you. Do you use the mild or the hot banana peppers in that recipe? I use the hot. It is a, now if, if hot offends you, that's fine. Use the mild, um, but it is a hot and spicy feta dish. Again, recipes are great guidelines. I don't even have them in front of me. I'm just kind of making things the way I want to. If I forget something, say, Mike, what about this, that, or the other? I make what I like. If you don't like hot, use the milder. If, um, you know, if you want, if you don't, if you're allergic to chives or onions, use something different. Just put some parsley on there for color. Um, again, guidelines, you're the one eating it, not me. But there is your first of your mezzi dips. And again, I, I, I pick these just to show you different techniques and stuff. And, and quite frankly, I live alone right now. My girlfriend's not gonna be here till the weekend. I've got to eat all this stuff. So I also pick things that I, I like. Um, that's your first of your mezzi dishes. Let's get the... Okay, so let's make the second one now. Let's do the scordalia, which is the potato dish. I just took potatoes, peeled them, diced them. This tray is hot and I'm holding it. Uh, and heated them up. They're cooked through. They're mushy, but not too mushy. They still have a little bit of body to them. You've got your garlic, you got your lemon, you got two slices of bread, you have parsley, a little bit of water, olive oil. Does anybody need me to peel a potato and show you how to dice it? I'm happy to do it. I think we know that. Okay, that, that's why I went ahead and did a lot of this stuff is I, I didn't want to, insult your intelligence now with a lemon i if it calls for lemon juice you know under like a cup or two cups i always squeeze my own lemons peggy asks what was the temperature for the diced potatoes these are just warm enough right now i mean i just put them in boiling water cooked them through i took them out and the reason I put them in the oven, A, was to, keep, was to dry them out so there's not too much liquid in there. But these are, I mean, I just pulled these out of a 350 degree oven and I'm holding the pan. So they're not that hot. But you want them cool enough or hot enough that they'll go through without having to uh, put a lot of effort into it. Um, does that answer your question? They're above room temperature. They're above my body temperature. So I'm thinking they're about, uh, you know, 110 degrees. 105 degrees. Thank when you. you. Yeah, when you get a lemon and you want the juice, roll it, roll it a few times. 
you're breaking the pulp inside and you'll be able to extract more juice from it. I'm gonna go ahead and take my lids off of everything. And another thing is the amount of equipment you have in your kitchen. You know, I have a lot because I'm a chef. What you want to get is this is the parsley. Everything you see today has been washed clean. This is parsley. This is just water. Um, you want your equipment to be multi-useful. You don't want to have to have three Cuisinarts, which I do, but you don't, you want one piece of equipment to do multiple things. This is a stick mixer. It's Cuisinart. Again, I don't have anything to do with it. You can add this to it to make a burr mixer. You can add this to it to an electric whisk. What we're adding to it is this to make another Cuisinart. I found this at Sam's Club and you have another Cuisinart. One, one motor, three different uses. Uh, I like stuff like that. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna slice this. The other thing is, is when you wanna juice a lemon, we all grew up with one of these. I don't know why I still have in a drawer. I think it's to show you that I don't like it. Get yourself one of these. When you're at a bar, when you're at a restaurant, when you see professionals doing things, find out what kind of equipment they use. They know what's better. They know what works better and they know it. And look at all that juice that just came out of there. No seeds. Okay. So we're going to throw in some parsley, throw in some garlic or olive oil. I'm only going to put it half the water in. You can always adjust the water as needed. And we're going to do a shallot. Um, these are large shallots, so I'm only going to use about a half of a shallot. We're going to just do a rough chop. Get the skin off there. And there's a question about where do you find the juicer? Where do you get it? Oh, 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 TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Kroger's has one in there the other day. I bought, uh, I bought some uh, um, cheesecloth the other day at Kroger's, and I saw one of these right there. They'll have them yellow for lemons. I don't have one here, but they have them green for limes. Just get the bigger one of the two. A lime fits in here as easy as a lemon does. Uh, but yeah, and they're like $6.99. Um, and if you make your own lemonade from scratch, these things are key. So again, we're gonna show you a little bit. Grab your knife. I would just do a rough cut, but I'm just showing you how easy it is to um, dice anything. If you want bigger dice, you just move your finger back more. Move your finger back more. Let the knife, don't shove the knife, roll the knife through. The knife is curved to make that rocking motion. Roll the knife, roll the knife. I'm barely pushing down. Also, my knives are really sharp, but um, you know, um, I just wanted to show you an easy way to, to, to dice things. Do you sharpen your own knives or do you have them professionally sharpened by whom? I do sharpen them before and after each use. I take them to a steel. This keeps them sharp longer. It doesn't sharpen it. It will keep, it will knock any burrs off of it. This is 90 degrees. This is 45, 22 and a half is where you want it. And by the way, if I'm doing this, I should be the only one doing this to my knives. If you do it, you're gonna be a little bit off and you'll dull my knife and I'll dull your knife. Everyone should have their own knife. Um, I don't know how close you are with your partner in your house. Get your own knives or get a new partner, um, one or the other. 
Um, always do that before and after. The other thing that I will I will fire you for is if you're dicing something and then you take your knife and you scrape it across the board like that, flip your knife over and do it that way. It takes a nanosecond to do. You're using the dull part of your knife to scrape things off. All you're doing is A, you're making a weird noise and B, you're, you're dulling your knife. So I hone my knives every single time. I use them when I start and when I finish, I hone them. Um, and then when I sharpen them, I have a sharpening stone here. A Little bit of oil on there. And then you go through and you sharpen your knives. There are other things out there you can buy. Uh, hold on. And Peggy Deldrich asks, do you have a recommended knife sharpener? No, you can buy these as well. You run it through, it'll, th this will grind it down dull, this will sharpen it, this will hone it. Uh, I, I don't know who sharpens knives because I do my own. This is what happens when you use one of these too often. I think she meant a brand or a style. Well, here I have the chef's choice, but I don't know. Can you see how they're the same size knife, but do you see how thin this one is now compared to this one? Because it was put through this one too many times. This, this knife used to be about this much thicker. You will, this is a 35 year old knife. But if you use this too often, you will turn this into a boning knife from a chef's knife. Um, but yeah, use this if you want. It's an easy way to do it, but it will make your knife smaller. This is also chef's choice um, edge crafter. Uh, I've had this stuff so long, it's all 30 years old. I don't know where to get stuff in town anymore, uh, but I would imagine um, Sir La Table doesn't exist, do they? I'm sure there's a kitchen store somewhere, or as we all know, Amazon. So we mixed everything together in here. Are we back to this? Are we all good on knives and sharpening? I'll take that as a yes. Um, we just wanna puree this up. And before I forget, we need to add bread to it. We're just using regular old white bread, nothing fancy, nothing too crusty, nothing too artisan. This is for bulk. I think this has a safety feature on top you push. I want this good and garlicky. So we, we, we set the water aside in, in case we need it. All right. So now we will use this. This is called a ricer. Whenever I make mashed potatoes, I use this. I don't use a smasher. I don't use a Cuisinart. You can beat the... Uh, you beat the starch out of it, you make it kind of runny, you make it kind of, uh, or it's too lumpy. This will make perfectly smooth mashed potatoes. Put the product in there. And I think I let them cool a little too long because this is a very hard press. If the potatoes were a little warmer, they would go through much easier. This was two whole russet potatoes. Russet has a nice, um, 
consistency, a nice flavor. You know, you want to use Yukon Gold, you can do it. Certain potatoes uh, work better for certain things. I'm not a potato expert. Russet always makes a decent potato and or always is a decent potato. And they will uh, always give you a nice consistency. Now, I did put this in the oven again, like I said, to take some of the water out of that uh, when you boil a potato. It's fluffy, it's not lumpy, it's not runny, it's perfect. And all we're doing is adding this to it. And I wish somebody was here to be my taste tester. You can always add more, you can't take it out. We can add more potatoes. Give it a little splash of water to thin it out. You can also thin it out with a little bit of a, a little bit of olive oil if you want. Quite frankly, that's really good. A little bit parsley. I'll be honest with you, I want more garlic in there. I'm just gonna add a little bit more garlic. I have garlic in my fridge all the time. And if you don't like garlic, don't do it. And that is your squidalia. Dip number two. I talked to my uncle John yesterday. His mother, born in the Southern Peloponnese, my grandmother, my yaya, Southern Peloponnese, Greece. She always made this nice dip. He said she always served it with, with fish. I don't know how they did it, but he, he was excited about this. It took him back to his childhood. So there's your squidalia. And we will tray this up in a little bit and put it with the mezzi platter. It's actually called mezzi. Greeks pronounce all their vowels. I've got a niece named Zoe. My yaya, when she was alive, would only call her Zoe. You're not allowed to say Zoe. All right, we're gonna get to the... We're gonna to get to the um, last of the three that we had planned is the um, tzatziki. Tzatziki is a yogurt-based sauce. And uh, what we did was we took, hold on. I think this is just Sam's Club Greek yogurt. It is unflavored. There's, it's just plain, plain yogurt. What I did is put it on the top of a cheesecloth, a little plastic over it so it didn't get crusty and let it drain for two days. Uh, how many ounces did I call for? Eight, 16 ounces of, of this? 16. 16, there you go. That's how much liquid bled out of the 16 ounces. Can you see that? You want your tzatziki sauce to be thick and creamy. Save this. If it's too thick, put some of that back in there. Don't add water, don't add anything else. Put that back in there, that's flavor. But look how thick that is. So we let it drain for two days. As to your cucumber, same thing. All these knuckle busters or box graters, but if you know why we call them a knuckle buster. You're gonna to wanna to get your cucumber, which I peeled. Uh, I just wanna get that off. And you wanna shred do a you, Go ahead. 
Do you use the full fat yogurt, Greek yogurt? Yeah. 5%, 2%, 0%? What? This is non-fat plain Greek yogurt. Non-fat? Hmm. Yeah, that's what they had at Sam's Club. Um, and I just noticed that. <laughs> but um, uh, again, it's 0%, which is, I, I'm surprised I picked that up. I must not have been paying attention. Um, I would normally use the full fat. What you want to do is you want to shred your cucumber. Make sure you don't get the seeds in there. And Marlene asks, do you mince your own garlic and make your own breadcrumbs? Uh, breadcrumbs this time I did not. Um, I, I don't keep bread in the house because I'm trying to lose weight. So I don't have any stale bread to make breadcrumbs with, but I do mince my own garlic. And quite frankly, I buy garlic in a box already pre-peeled. Um, I get it at Restaurant Depot. And then I just use this little mixing thing. I, um, I did the uh, feta cheese in. I just puree it all up at once. Um, Breadcrumbs, if, if I'm working in a restaurant, we do save bread. Uh, we do make our own breadcrumbs, but um, I don't keep bread in the house. So I just bought some, always plain. Um, I pretty much buy everything plain, your tomatoes, you know, bread. Um, you can always add your own seasonings. You can't take out their seasonings. So um, I'm not doing the whole thing because I've already done this because it took time. So what you want to do Again, you want to take this. And you want to squeeze out the liquid. It will bleed off a lot of liquid. Three hours ago, I did this. And this is what we have. I have changed this paper towel three times since I did this a couple hours ago. And you have your cucumber. Let's find a little mixing ball. We'll put our yogurt in there. Put our garlic in there. Again, I like a lot of garlic. We probably will be adding more garlic to this in a minute. A little bit of salt, olive oil, and your and your cucumbers. See if we just can't mix this up. Olive oil helps loosen it up. Now, that's the way I make mine. Um, I know I'm gonna like a little bit more garlic in for me. Um, some people put dill in there afterwards. I do not. Some people put mint in there. Uh, we, can, we can do that if you want. We'll, we'll, we'll split it up in two and put mint in part and not have mint in the other part. You can see how thick that is. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Um, that was very good. It is a nice stick. It is not runny. You buy tzatziki in the store, it's runny. The reason is, is it's got a lot of liquid in it. I don't think we need any liquid in there, but we're gonna save it just in case. So what we'll do, take half of it out. I bought some fresh mint just to give you all an idea what the difference is. We 
we chopped it. Same thing, you just pick it off. What you wanna do is you wanna get the biggest leaf of mint you have, put all the smaller ones in there and roll it around. Chop your mint, flip your knife upside down, scrape it together. You have mint, not hard to do. Do it quick, simple. Uh, work on your knife skills. It's a, it, it makes your life a lot easier if you get a little bit more adept with a knife. It doesn't take long to prep things out. So this is the uh, second part. We have some with mint, some without. Whoever asked me about stainless steel bowls earlier, how many of you counted it I've used today? There's a lot. All right, so we have tzatziki. We have tzatziki without mint. We have your scordilia. And we have your feta. Now let's assemble a mezzi platter. Um, get that sheet out with everything we have. We, we've just got a bunch of different stuff. I bought, I bought dates. We have Kalamata olives. I always get my olives with the pit in them. Once you pit it, the integrity of the flesh starts to crush. They start to sit, they start to soak too much in the center. They start to get mushy. Um, Kephalogatophia cheese. This is a plain, I'm going to read off the back so you know what it is, a plain golden Greek cheese made from sheep's milk with the hard rind and tiny holes, a bit salty and somewhat pungent. It's often fried to make the famous Greek dish saganaki. Cassetti. Uh, this is a soft, uh, aged over six months. It's a soft uh, Greek cheese. Um, not, uh, I think it's got a mild flavor. And then we'll have feta. I've got tomatoes, I've got pepper, I got red onion, I got olives. Um, you know, we're just gonna put a bunch of different stuff down on the platter. We've got walnuts, cheese sticks. All this stuff was on sale. We've got Greek triangle peppers, artichoke hearts, roasted red peppers, lemons, wild anchovies, octopus. We can put whatever you want on there, Greek green beans and domadias. I never make domadias. I always buy them in the can. I always make sure I get them from Greece. Don't get the Chinese ones. Um, it, they're just not as good. Don't get, the Turkish ones are pretty good as well. But this is, this is we're gonna use all this stuff to try to um, assemble a couple of different platters. If you can give me one second to clear off a little space for us, I would appreciate it. Is everybody caught up? Did it make sense? Was it easy enough? We try to do recipes that are easy enough. You can do at home without having a super lot of talent, but it, you know, they look, they're, they're good, they're tasty and they're uh, authentic, but you don't need a lot of talent. Did I make this look easy or is it too hard? Is it too complicated? Are we in good shape? Or are we in bad shape? I you make it look amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to like underdo it where it's like, well, you know, that, that wasn't hard. Um, I do cook for a living. Um, you know, I've made these things and then I've watched other people try to make it after me and it becomes a mess because they don't cook for a living. 
Um, it is easy. And um, I don't want to like sell you guys short on this class by, uh, you know, not doing anything too hard, but I mean, it's, cooking should be fun. I never have lunch at 1115, but you've made me hungry. There you go. Um, I'm very hungry, quite frankly. Uh, apparently I vacuumed too long this morning and didn't have breakfast. Um, we're just going to start prepping this stuff out. I have no idea what these are going to look like, okay? I didn't plan. I pulled a few plates out for us. Um, and, um, you know, I just kind of build things and I kind of see what I have, what works, what doesn't work. Always have PETA. This is also from Nix. It's PETA. There's no pocket. These things are also good if you toast them off put it well i use my own salsa that i make cheese i make a pizza out of it we make yidles out of this we just use it for dip we cut it into triangles we toast them you've got pita chips for whatever you got we're going to heat a few of these up in the oven always have some pita um that's good uh we will use some of the feta we have three cheeses we'll get some vegetables on here Everything's been cleaned, everything's been washed, everything's been dried off. When I do a pepper, I kind of just go around the outside. I'm not gonna do all of it. This is the pith right here, the white part. If you're using a jalapeno, that's where the heat is. If you're using a, a habanero, that's where the heat is. The heat is also in the seeds. Once you take out the seeds and the pith, it's a much milder pepper. So I always say, plus it doesn't look good to have that in there. The other thing about peppers is when you slice them, this is the skin side, this is the internal flesh side. I always go through the internal flesh side. It's easier to do. You can do it this way as well. Note my hands are curled. I'm running the knife down my knuckle. If I get my fingers out here, if I hold it like this, something's going to get in the way and you're going to cut it off. Knife skills are pretty important. We'll just, and, and I, uh, I didn't prep this out because I wanted to show you a few, a, a few tricks of the trade with the knives, but you got some nice color. Red onion, same thing. We cut the top off. We didn't cut the uh, whole root end off. We left enough there because that's what holds the whole onion together. And we want some nice, big, thick slices. Tomato, you can get a tomato shark and cut it out. That's just another piece of equipment in your thing. It's nothing that a, that a paring knife can't do. These are probably the three knives you need. You need a boning knife, a paring knife, and a uh, chef's knife. I recommend six to eight inches. Anything bigger than that becomes a little bit unwieldy, hard to deal with. I've got a 12 inch one here. I don't like using it. It's just, it's just, too big this seems to be a perfect size for me find out the knife you like find out the knife that fits your hand you know people have bigger hands and smaller hands than i do um these are also good knives one piece this piece here is the tang i like a thicker tang right here this is a little thin it usually cuts into my hand but i actually i really like this knife it's one piece very nice knife um but get a knife that fits your hand don't get it too big just to be impressing people. You know, you don't need a samurai sword to do any of this stuff. Um, but we will do some nice chunks. Uh, it is February. Tomatoes do not look that great this time of year. Um, you cut the way you want to cut them. You know, what makes you happy? I'll just do a couple of different ways to get a couple of different looks. Um, and then we will start assembling here in a second.
We'll heat up some pita. Uh, whoever the gentleman was earlier that reminded me of my potatoes, you're you're on pita charge as well, okay? We want tomadias? I do. So that's a yes. Anybody else see anything else I had here that you want? Let's open it up. Let's get it on the platters. I'm a bit interested in this octopus. I've never used it. Um, did all those things come from Nick's? Yep. Um, yeah, all the interesting things did. These came from Kroger's. They were, quite frankly, they were on the discount shelf. Um, but the interesting stuff did come from Nick's Produce. I'm actually going to eat one of these octopus pieces to see how it is. Honestly, tastes a little bit like um, just a sardine. It's in the same kind of oil. Uh, it's with the vinegar. Nothing fantastic. I will tell you, Stella's has the best Greek food in town. I, they're on. I don't think they're Lombardi. I, 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 I again, I don't. I don't get paid to tell you this. Um, I think they're the best Greek food in town. I ate at Zorba's the other day. I would. Um, was not for me. Other people might like it. Um, and then Demi's over on MacArthur, they have great Mediterranean platters as well. Uh, I think those are two of my favorite restaurants in town. Um, again, I'm not getting paid to do that. I'm not trying to push one above the other, but I think they make some of the best authentic Greek food around. We've got dates. We've got walnuts. Greeks use walnuts and everything, golden figs. And we will start assembling We will start assembling a platter here soon. All right. Use, use, use what you have. No need to go out and buy anything. I, um, again, have a lot of stuff because I do a lot of stuff on uh, Facebook and YouTube with food. So I like to have it look a little bit different, a little bit more unique, a little bit more interesting. Um, this actually... We'll use the one with mint. And you're left to your own creativity. You're left to your own plate presentation. You're left to your own designs. Um, I taught a class once, I don't know, Virginia Gourmet, I think they're since closed, um, where we did uh, a plate similar to this. And, and, and mine flows and goes around like this. And then this gentleman made it. He had lined up his tomadias, lined up his olives, lined up his, you know, his figs. Everything was in the perfect line. I just looked at him and jokingly, I said, what are you, an accountant? And he's like, yes, because he, he, that was his creativity was everything was in a line and it came down to the bottom right-hand corner of the profit and loss margin. Um, it's your pita. I gotcha. So we'll do the pita in the, we'll do triangles.
nice and warm. And we'll just build it out as we see fit. There's no rhyme or reason to what I'm doing. You want to offset, oh, I was saying earlier, these tomatoes are terrible. It's not the time of year for tomatoes, but we need some on there for color. We want it to look good. Um, but yeah, I wish the tomatoes were in a little bit better season. But you want to you alternate colors. Um, Greek food isn't fun. It isn't exciting. It isn't sexy. Um, it's all brown, basically, uh, and white. Uh, you have very little color in it. And um, so you want to alternate what little color you do have. And these are domadias. Domadias are grape leaves. I, like, again, I don't make them. I don't like to deal with them. I just buy them out of the can. They're grape leaves. They're stuffed with a rice mixture. Um, my grandmother would put lamb in there as well. Nick's Produce will also have the big bin and they'll dip their olives out for you. Um, one thing about platters like this is if you have olives and people are just eating at the table, you need a bowl for pits for them to get rid of their pits in. Um, If there was something else you wanted me to add, just holler out, I'll put it on there. If you, you want it on your platter, we'll do your platter with that on there. Oh, here we go. Got some figs. The figs look very similar in color to the domada, so we put them on the opposite ends of the plate. Got a couple of, uh, I'm sorry, those are, uh, those are um, not figs, they're dates. Figs you wanna slice open because they got that beautiful color on the inside. These are dried golden figs. Some breadsticks. Kay has mentioned that she likes Greek taverna too for a restaurant. Okay, we'll have to give it a shot. Where is that? It's on um, Broad Street. I think it's where the crazy Greek used to be. Up there near Staples Mill? Yeah, yeah. It's just close by. And we tried it for the first time. Like I've, it, never, you... I've never been to Demi's, though. Demi's, I... Demi's is over on MacArthur. Yep. Um, Jimmy Chamorris, actually, he owns Dots Back In, which is right across the street as well. And that's been on diners, drive-ins, and dives. Um, if you notice, we're just, we're, we're, we're doing the cheese. We're doing it in different shapes, different sizes. You know, you want to get a little bit of height to your plate. You want to get a little bit of a variety. 
Um, I don't know who I was speaking with a second ago, but what did you have at Trevenia? I can't remember. <laughs> it was good. I think my husband got a fish dish. I don't know. I can't remember. It was very reasonable and I thought it was good. I don't know. That's really all that counts. Did you yeah. like it? Were you happy? <laughs> Fine. Just because I don't like something doesn't mean it's not good for you, you know? Um, you know, I like a lot of black pepper on my stuff. Other people don't. I think I've made a fantastic dish. You think it's awful. I can't make everyone happy. Um, so if that's for you, then, then go for it. I mean, I have got zero issue with that whatsoever. Are these coming along okay for you guys? Looks great. Do a little roasted pepper. We need to slice that up a bit. I might have overbought. Got the figs here. Throw in some nuts. I'm going to add some pistachios. Uh, we have tomatoes. We're not going to use the Greek tomatoes. I think we're done with this tray. Yeah, we can put some olives on this one. We've got our Got our dips all set. I'm trying to get you a clean picture of what this looks like without a big mess on it. Um, there's a question, are the walnuts typically toasted? Uh, you can, these are not. Uh, and um, I'll tell you why because I'm probably not going to eat all the walnuts. They're going to go back in the bin and I'm going to use them in baklava or something. I don't want to toast them because I'm not eating all this today. I live alone again. Um, uh, you can toast the walnuts. You can, again, it's up to you and your, and your wishes. What do you like? And another question in the handout, the dish has eggs. Are they hard boiled? Yes. Um, again, that was just a bunch of suggestions. Obviously, we don't have every single thing in that list. Um, you know, it gets to be too much. But um, I also want to try these. I've never had these before. Uh, you get the traditional flat anchovies at Kroger's. I've never had these. These might be a little bit more. I don't know, we'll find out, you know. Quite frankly, a lot of this stuff is going to go into an omelet tomorrow. Um, you know, you got to find different ways to use, utilize your uh, your leftovers. So these are some anchovies here. Can you see those? And was the label on them wild anchovies? Yep, wild anchovies. Okay. Sorry, I pulled that out of the trash can. Actually, I just spilled everywhere. They are actually very good. They are not your typical anchovies of that, you know, that really harsh you get on like a cheap pizza. Tastes more like sardines. Not overly offensive. Do they look okay for you guys? They look great. So there is two. Anything else you want me to put on there? Anything else that I pulled out that you would like to see what it looks like? I have a question about um, these dips you made. Would you just 
normally just use pita? Yeah, you can use pita. You can use breadsticks. Um, almost every Greek dish is going to have way too much pita on there. What, what else would you think that you would want to use? Well, that's what I'm asking, because if you're trying to get rid of bread, I was wondering if you use cucumber slices or... Well, you can do apple. that. Um, I don't know if an apple, a cucumber slice would work well. I would use, um, I would use those English cucumbers, those seedless ones. Um, uh, that might work. Or some crostinis, get a French baguette or something, slice it, butter half, toast it off. And then uh, you could uh, use that as well. Why could you use like uh, celery sticks? You can. I hate celery. <laughs> okay. I love it. That would be good. I hate celery. Oh, oh I won't. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the <laughs> only thing celery is good for is to dip in your peanut butter jar and eat it. Um, <laughs> that's what I like celery for. Um, I, I think we're kind of out of space on this. So what I want to do is show you where we are with the pasticcio right now, okay? Okay, there's one more question. Go ahead. What is the easiest way to pit olives? There's your, I'll, I'll answer that in one second. There's your pasticcio. It still has a ways to go, but it's, you see how firm that is? You see how jiggly that is? It still has a little bit to go. I was wondering, olive, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was wondering if you would ever put any kind of meat on there. Well, we have the sardines. Uh, we have the octopus, which I didn't put on there because I didn't like it. Um, but yeah, what, what, what else did I list in that, uh, in that list of things? It's mostly just a noshing platter. A lot of people, my, my yaya used to make the uh, domadias with lamb in there. So she did do that as well. But like um, no smoked meat, because that would be, of course, Italian, like a, a salami or something. Sweet. Yeah, that's the wrong side of the Mediterranean, to be honest with you. I don't know what gotcha. those people are up to, but uh, they're not doing <laughs> it right. Um, well, this, this is yummy looking, so you did good. So I want to show you all something real quick while I'm standing here. Uh, hold on. Since the pasticcio isn't done, I made one yesterday because I didn't think it was going to be done in time. So we're going to try to slice a piece of pasticcio and, and show you what that looks like. I have, I have a knife drawer here with my good knives in it, and then I have a cutting block with other knives in it. Those are my cheap knives that anyone can use. These are the ones that I will use to cut into a metal pan. Cause I told you earlier, I don't like to use anything on a metal pan. These are my cheap knives. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut into this. We'll do it in thirds. I need a spatula. Just real quick, you can also use something like this to put your mezzi platter on, you know, just build it here, whatever you have. Um, no need to go out of your way.
Can you see that? That's your pasticcio. Looks good. So I'm trying to make this look nice for y'all real quick. How much time do we have? About 17 minutes. All right. We have a bunch of stuff here. This is not on your, okay, first before I start. Are we happy with our class today? Are we happy with what we did? Definitely. Does it look okay? Does it look like something we, uh, you can make and impress your family and friends with? Absolutely. So I was thinking this morning, we have a lot of stuff left over. This is the yogurt, okay? Nice little bowl. I don't want you to think everything we make is, is one use. You, when you look at what you have, be creative with what you have. We have yogurt. We have figs. And what cheeses were on the platter again? Kefalateira. Kefalateira and the uh, Kasimi. Kasiri. And uh, feta. So another reason not to not to toast your own, uh, so what we're doing is we're utilizing the leftover, the leftover yogurt. We have some figs. We put some walnuts on there. This is honey from one of my beehives. I raise bees. Um, I name them different things. I name this one the Yaya hive. That's grandmother in Greek. This is from my mom. If you get honey out of a local, there, you've taken your savory dishes and you've made yourself a sweet dish. Not bad, right? It's one more thing. Let me show you one more thing. This, this is Yudo meat, gyros. Comes in a box, comes pre-sliced, right? I think, I think Nick's produce will send you, sell you smaller chunks. Uh, we're gonna make a yido here in about five minutes to show you how easy these things are to make. It's just a bonus to this class because we have a lot of nice food here. We might as well throw a yido in there as well. So we're gonna heat up a pita. Um, I pulled out a few pieces. I thought if we had extra time, I'd just show you how quick and simple this is. I'm gonna figure to give you a little bit more bang for your buck for this class. Is that okay that I do this, Peggy? Absolutely. I mean, if anybody has any questions on here, I mean, we have, a, I think a pretty impressive looking uh, array of food. Um, but we still had the question about the easiest way to pit olives. Yeah, 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 you're right. Um, I usually just put them in my mouth and eat the pit out. Uh, the other way to do it is um, they make olive pitters. Can you see me in the corner here? You just slice, slice, yeah. slice, and slice. 
you're going to get that, but you're not going to get a pitted olive. Um, they make olive pitters. Um, but that's, that's the way in culinary school that we pitted olives. Um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get the olive out and keep it whole, to be honest with you. Um, so what I'm going to do is just heat three or four pieces of this up. More questions. This is going to take one second to get the oven up to temperature or the stove top up to temperature. I'm just trying to show you that there's more things to do with what we have left over. And I want to give you a little bit more than you uh, bargained for with this class, if that's okay. No questions? Uh, what are you heating up? The yiddle meat. Gyro so meat. Gyro meat. We're going to make a quick yiddle because we, we've, we've gone ahead and we've made, we've made, um, we've made a tzatziki. We've made everything. I have yiddle meat here because quite frankly, I love those things and I eat them all the time. Um, what you'll need is a little bit of lettuce, shredded lettuce. Again, I diced a tomato this morning. I took one of those tomatoes and diced it. A little bit of onion. I had the onion for the pasticcio, not doing anything special. Onion, we're good to go. It heats quickly. You guys are testing my ability with all my, I've used every single tool in this house. You'll see that it will, it will start to crisp up quickly and you will see that it does bleed a lot of fat. And that's why I brought this out. We'll drain some of that fat off. So what we're going to do What did I do with that? We're going to take some of our tzatziki. I like to put a little bit on the bottom here. We're going to layer some yiddle meat. And is that lamb? It's a mixture of spiced lamb and beef. Comes pre made, pre sliced. I don't know if you can see, I'm just putting some onions, some tomatoes, some lettuce. How hard was that? You got yourself a gyro, a needle. A little bit of a bonus to what we're doing today. A lot of people will put French fries in there. I don't like that. I don't know if y'all go to Pittsburgh and get a Permani burger. They put uh, they put fries in there. I don't I don't like fries in my sandwich. But yeah, so we have the class. We went a little bit further. We got the needle. We got the um, 
the, the uh, little bit of a, uh, a breakfast dish or a little bit of a dessert just to show you how to cross utilize things. And I think that is everything, right? Are you happy with this? What kind of wine are you offering? This is Retsina. It's a Greek wine. It has a little bit of a pine taste to it because they, uh, they, um, they, they uh, age it in barrels with pine resin. And um, it gets a little bit of a taste. It's, it's, it's actually a hell of a lot better than it used to be 20 years ago. Um, they've actually, it's, it's actually not a bad little white wine, but it is a traditional Greek wine. It's a Retsina and, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is um, a nice, refreshing summer wine. All right, are we happy? Greek food. Oh my gosh, it was terrific. Yeah, we're happy. We were eating Yay. it. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I got up Bravo. at five. I got up at five, so it's like three in the afternoon for me. So I'm going to go ahead and try this. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any qu any questions? Any answers? Anything? Peggy's got my name and number. I'm easy to find. I'm Mike at Gunther's Gourmet. You can look us up if you got cooking questions. We're here for you. Okay. Um, I guess um, U of R will ask you for a review of the class. Um, be honest, if, if, if it, my back was turned too much, you couldn't hear me, if it was too easy, if it was too hard, I need to learn as well to make these classes more fun for you guys. Um, I try to give you a few extra things in here, but um, I, and I try to show you some knife skills and I try to show you some different equipment to use. So let me know what you enjoyed, what you didn't enjoy. Um, I can't get better without you telling me what I screwed up with. And, Y'all can all call my girlfriend up and tell her I communicated fairly decently today. <laughs> That's so, so, Mike, a couple things. Um, huh? I'm going to stop recording right now.